Nick Young. I'm an early childhood music educator. I've been teaching music in preschool classrooms for over 30 years, and I'm really excited today to be coming to you to show you my approach to early childhood music education and give you some tools and techniques that you'll be able to start using right away in your classroom or your home. So um, I'm a musician, and I know a lot of you are not musicians. So I want to just uh, tell you right at the outset that the tools I'm going to be giving you are something that you'll be able to use as a non-musician. I'm also going to be giving you access to materials online that you'll be able to use to lead interactive music and movement activities with your students in the classroom, with your students online in the virtual learning space, or for parents working with their children at home. So uh, interactive music and movement is all about bringing the joy of music to children in their early years, and their preschool age years. And what I'm going to be showing you today applies to children who are uh, in their toddler and infant years, in their preschool years, and also applies to children in kindergarten and even early elementary. But our main focus is on preschool. So uh, we're going to get started. The very first uh, section that I want to start talking to you about are uh, something I call imaginative and directed movement. So uh, all of uh, the songs in my own curriculum are, are either, uh, they're interactive in some way. So they're, they're interactive where the children are moving their bodies, uh, maybe they're moving like different kinds of animals, uh, or they're moving, the song is directing them to tap their foot, wiggle their shoulders, uh, jump up, turn around, uh, or they're maybe sitting down playing uh, instruments like shakers and drums and scrapers and triangles and bells, uh, learning how to play along with songs, play rhythm sounds and play rhythm games, and also to tell uh, musical stories using their voices and the instruments. Uh, so the main thread that runs through everything I do is that it's fun and it's interactive. So interactivity is the essential element. When we're talking about working with children who are in early childhood, everything they are doing has to be interactive. There's never a time when I, when I ask the children to sit down and just passively listen to me do something musical or watch something without them participating in it. Also uh, of very high importance is that we make everything uh, we come to them in the world of play because play is where they learn. Uh, and so that's where we meet them. So everything we do uh, has the play element. It's all about playing, whether they're pretending to, and using their imagination to move like a different, some kind of an animal or a superhero or a train or a car or a boat or a plane, or uh, if they're just having fun dancing or if they're playing musical instruments uh, or telling stories. It's all in the context of play and fun and joy. Joy is really the center of the whole thing. And the wonderful thing is that um, even though we're everything we do is intuitive and easy and effortless, uh, the wonderful thing about it is that the children are gaining uh, all these wonderful developmental benefits. So when the children are, are participating in these interactive music and movement activities, uh, they're going to be uh, having a developmental boost uh, in their language development. That's huge. Children develop language through play, uh, through music. Um, and I know, you know, us as adults, we know that it's easy for us to remember the lyrics of songs that we like because we are learning those lyrics in the context of music and rhythm and melody. It's the same for children. Uh, children, uh, their relationship with music is just instinctive and innate. You know, we know this because when we work with young children, even infants who have no language abilities yet, when we bring in uh, and play some music that has a rhythm, a beat to it, we can see those infants starting to move their bodies to the rhythm and responding. Uh, to the music in that way. So we know it's something that's just part of who we are as human beings. We have music as part of us. Uh, so there's uh, language development, cognitive development, 
Uh, there's uh, social and emotional development and impulse control. There's gross motor skills, fine motor skills. Uh, there's just so many, their mathematical ability is, is boosted. Uh, their academic performance is boosted. And the overall uh, boost that all these things add up to is school readiness. So really what we're doing is giving them an opportunity to develop in ways that's going to prepare them for kindergarten and for moving on uh, in their career in uh, school, moving through kindergarten and elementary and all the way. The boost that we're giving them at this age developmentally is something that they're going to carry with them throughout the rest of their lives. So even though it's something where we get to play and have fun, uh, we also know that those developmental benefits are present and they are very significant. So let's get started. The first part I'm going to talk to you about is imaginative and directed movement. Uh, then we're going to get into instruments and rhythm games. And then we're going to talk about uh, musical storytelling. And then finally, we're going to have uh, a, a little bit about class management because uh, we know as teachers and parents that when we get our children and our students active and moving and dancing, there are some, some uh, specific uh, class management uh, uh, situations that arise. And uh, what I believe very strongly is those, those class management challenges are actually developmental opportunities, uh, especially in the realm of social and emotional development and impulse control. All right, here we go. So we're going to start with a directed movement activity. A directed movement, as I said before, is when uh, the children are directed specifically to move their bodies in certain ways. So uh, in the song we're going to do right now, we're going to shake our hands. And what we do is we demonstrate that before we start the song. So as the teacher uh, leading the music group, uh, you always want to give a little introduction before you start the activity. Uh, so in this case, I'll say, okay, friends, we're going to shake our hands. Show me how you shake, shake your hands like this. And I model the movement of shaking my hands. And I notice that the children are also doing that. And then as we start the song, they have an idea of what they're going to be doing. And that uh, increases their engagement with the activity. All right, so everyone shake, shake your hands. Here we go. Shake, shake, shake your hands. Shake, shake, shake your hands. Shake, shake, shake your hands. Now get up. It's time to stand up and jump. Jump, jump, jump so high. Jump. an example of a really basic introductory uh, directed movement song. That's one that I often start my music groups with just to get the children engaged and moving. Uh, another one I do is uh, well, we start by tapping our toes. So um, just to give you some context, uh, when I do my music groups in the classroom, I have all the students sitting around the perimeter of the group space whether that's your big circular rug or your rectangle rug or whatever shape it is, they're all sitting around the edge facing towards the middle and I'm sitting on the edge facing towards the middle as well. So you, as the leader of the music group, you're gonna be using pre-recorded music if you're not a musician, uh, which is probably the case. If you are a musician, if you play guitar uh, or another instrument that you can use to lead the music group, then you'll have that with you. But actually what works even better is when you use pre-recorded music because then your body is completely free to model the movements along with your students. And that really is an important element in increasing their engagement. What we want to do is we want to get them engaged and active and we want to keep their engagement and their attention throughout the music time. Uh, and you'll notice when I'm presenting the music that I do it with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, and that's another way that I keep the, my students' attention is by really being 100% engaged myself with what we're doing. So another example, the, the next one I want to do is another directed movement song. And so you're sitting around the edge of the group. Uh, all of the children, their feet could be on the floor or they could be sitting cross-legged, but you're going to model the, move, the action of putting your feet on the floor and tapping your toes. Here we go. Tap, 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 tap,
This is a song where this, the song is telling you exactly what to do with your body. And that makes it very simple for the children. And you can imagine a big group of 20 or 30 preschool age kids all dancing, all seeing you modeling the movements, all hearing the lyrics of the song that are directing them to tap their toes, jump and clap their hands to turn around. And so it makes it very simple and easy. There's no pre-practicing or learning of the song that needs to happen. The song has those elements already built in. So when you're choosing music for your classroom, uh, here's uh, the first element we wanna make sure is that it's interactive. So it's not a song about the children just passively listening to a, to a nice song. It has uh, an opportunity for them to be interacting throughout the whole song. Uh, it's either, and then this, in the case of a directed movement song, it's directing them in how they're going to be moving their bodies. Another element uh, is when the song gives a direction, such as uh, tap your toes, tap, 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 tap your toes, side to side is how it goes, tap your toes all in a row, tap, 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 tap your toes, jump and clap. So you'll see before I got to jump and clap, there's a long section of just tapping your toes. Uh, what I've noticed some of the songs uh, that do have interactive elements in them, uh, what you don't want is a song where it says, tap your toes, now jump and clap, because you have to give the children an opportunity to really get into that movement. It's gonna take them a minute to register, a few seconds, uh, what it is the song is asking them to do. They'll see you modeling the movement, and then we wanna have a chance for them to really enjoy that activity, that part of the song where they're tapping their toes, before we move on to stand up, jump, and clap your hands. And then for the jump and clap your hands, we have a long section of the song that's just about jumping and clapping your hands. Uh, you should avoid a song that doesn't give you and the children an opportunity to have that movement time before moving on to the next directed movement. All right, so that is uh, directed movement songs. Now let's move on to imaginative movement songs. So now we're going to do a song that we call imaginative movement. An imaginative movement song is a song, it's not like a directed movement song where it tells you specifically exactly how to move. It doesn't tell you tap your toes, jump and clap your hands. Uh, this In this type of song, we give the children a premise. In the case of this song, we're going to be moving like some different kinds of animals. So uh, the first thing we do is we're going to be walking like a tall giraffe. And I'll give an example at the very beginning of the song, before the song starts. I do a little introduction and I say, show me how you walk like a tall giraffe eating the leaves at the top of the tree. So I'm giving them some really specific uh, direction on how to do that. But then for the rest of the song, all I'm saying is move like these animals. So it'll be walking like a giraffe, slithering like a snake, swimming like an octopus, and then you, as the leader of the group, will be modeling the movements. But you have your own way of doing it, and we invite the children to move in the way that they want to do it. So the children will have different ways of walking like a giraffe, slithering like a snake, swimming like an octopus, crawling like a crab, all those things, there's ways for the children to be creative in how they do those movements. So uh, that's one of the wonderful things about imaginative movement. It was bring in bring in the creative element. Now, another thing that I want to mention about these types of songs, especially this type of a song where the children are moving inside the group space, uh, like some different kinds of animals. With a directed movement song, they might be standing on that uh, edge of the rug, edge, edge of the group space, as I mentioned, or they may move into the center space. 
with this type of song, they're definitely in the space together. They're all moving. So imagine 20 or 30 preschool age children all walking like a giraffe and they're all together. Uh, so uh, here's where some of those class management uh, challenges or opportunities for growth uh, can come in. Uh, you can imagine with the children all moving together in the group that they might be bumping into each other and they might be getting into a little bit of wrestling and that type of thing. So uh, what we wanna do is we just give them uh, a tool before we start. We say, put on your invisible bubble. And we model that action of putting on our invisible bubble around our whole body. And then we say, that means that your body will move where there's room to go without bumping your friends. Show me how you move without bumping your friends. Make sure that there's room to go without bumping your friends. However you wanna phrase it, but we kind of make it a point of putting on our invisible bubble before we start the song. That way, uh, during the song, if we need to, we can come back and say, remember your invisible bubble, make sure you move where there's room to go without bumping your friends. Now, of course, there will be some bumping, there will be some physical touching and things like that between the children. Uh, and that is totally fine. Uh, that's all part of them learning how to cooperate, uh, control their impulses to keep their friends safe, uh, their, their cognitive and social emotional development opportunities are there. Uh, but if we see some children that are getting a little too physical with their friends, we have that, we have that ability to use that tool of the invisible bubble uh, to help them to remember that we're doing this in a way that's safe for our bodies and for the bodies of our friends. Uh, so here we go, let's try this song. And of course we give the introduction. Prince, right now we're gonna move like some different kinds of animals. The first one is a tall giraffe. Show me how you walk like a tall giraffe eating the leaves at the top of the tree. Here we go. A giraffe has a neck that stretches to the sky. With his feet on the ground he comes walking by. Munching on the leaves at the top of a tree. A giraffe is as tall as an animal can be. Now slither like a snake. A snake likes to slither when its belly on the ground. Lets you know that he's coming with just fine without legs or feet. A snake is as low as an animal could be. Now swim like an octopus. Show me your long wiggly octopus arms. An octopus has eight long tentacles. On a rock it can make his skin identical. Swims all around in the deep blue sea. An octopus is clever as an animal could be. Now you're a cheetah. A cheetah has fur that helps it blend in. Lying in the grass of the savanna plain. Run so far, run so free. A cheetah is as fast as an animal could be. Now you're a big whale in the ocean. A whale likes to flip its tail in the air. Makes a splash in the water and takes a breath of air. Swims all around in the deep blue sea. A whale is as big as an animal could be. Now you're a lazy sloth. A sloth moves slowly in a leisurely style. Hanging in the tree, he likes to rest for a while. Why should he rush? There is no need. A sloth is as lazy as an animal can be. So you'll notice that the children get to move like all these different animals. And I also wanna just uh, call your attention to how I'm presenting the song as well. So you'll see from my facial expression, my vocal inflection, my body language, that I'm 100% engaged with this activity. I'm not doing the dishes, I'm not cleaning the tables. Uh, I am 100% with the children and that is so important. I'm also excited about it, I'm enthusiastic, I'm having fun, and that energy, of course, will transmit and transfer over to your students and they'll get excited and engaged and be having fun along with you. Now it's time to talk about instruments and rhythm sounds. So in our music groups, we like to use all kinds of different hand percussion instruments like shakers, triangles, scrapers, bells, drums. All those are, those are some really good basic instruments uh, that we like to use in our music groups. There are some instruments that we avoid. Uh, over three decades of working with children in the classroom doing music with preschoolers, uh, I have uh, kind of narrowed down the instruments that I use. Uh, I like egg shakers 
uh, especially if they're good quality. Those are wonderful for small hands. They're easy to use uh, and they're very durable. Uh, the, the specific instruments I like to use, I don't like to use really big, heavy. Sometimes you'll get maracas that have a lot of wood in them and they, and they could be used uh, accidentally, they might bump into their friends. The children, if they're sitting, because when we're doing instruments, we pass out the instruments, we're sitting around the edge of the group, facing towards the center again. So we've done those imaginative movement songs and directed movement songs, and now we're at the point in the group when we're sitting back down and we pass out the instruments. Uh, the children are going to be sitting next to their friends, and if they have something really heavy or long or sharp in their hand, they're going to swing it out and it might bump the friend in front of them. It might bump them. You want to make sure it's lightweight and is not going to hurt anybody if it bumps them. Uh, also, I don't like cymbals. Uh, those are tend to be metal and tend to be, kind of have like a sharp edge. And that also has the hazard of, of not being safe. Also, cymbals tend to be louder and we want to have instruments. They're all of an equal volume as much as we can. Uh, so that not there's not one instrument that gets too loud and drowns out the other instruments. Uh, those little tiny cymbals are fine, uh, but not my favorite because the little elastic band tends to get come off and get lost. So I just tend, tend to uh, stay away from cymbals in general. Uh, triangles are really nice. Uh, one thing you want to use is a triangle that has the the handle with the string that's attached. In the case of this illustration, it's not attached. It's just looping around the, the metal part there. And a lot of triangles that you'll get are like that. They just have a loop that goes around. And uh, what happens is that handle gets lost very quickly. So if you can find the kind where the, the string goes through a little hole in the metal, then it stays attached and you won't lose your handle as easily. Uh, scrapers are great. Uh, this one is, that tend, those tend to be kind of bit on the big heavy side. There's also the smaller kind that you hold and scrape like this that are highly recommended. Uh, bells are great. Make sure that they're durable and that the, the bell does not um, come off because that could be a choking hazard. So make sure it's something that's going to stay stuck on there and, and uh, be durable in that way. There's a lot of drums that you can find that will be that are not strong enough to be used in the preschool classroom because all these instruments are going to be heavily used by the children. So you want to find a drum that has a strong head on it that won't um, break too easily because, you know, there's a good chance that the children are going to find a way to stand up on it or put a lot of force into it. And there's a lot of drums that you'll find that are supposedly made to be used with children that are just not durable enough and that head will break and then that drum is useless after that. So there's some good ones out there. Just make sure you get the good durable kind. Okay, so let's talk about rhythm sounds. Um, in this case, I have my rhythm sounds in my background. Uh, when I'm teaching in person in the classroom, I have rhythm sound cards. So I have all these four rhythm sounds uh, in the form of a card and I can laminate that and uh, get it printed on colored paper so it's uh, a nice visual. Uh, and I'll t I like to have three of each of the different rhythm sounds. So I have three ta's, three tt's, three diggy diggies, and three toes. So the first sound is ta. This is actually a quarter note, but in our music time with the preschool children, we call it ta. And so when we're introducing these sounds to our students, we say this sound is called ta. And we say, how many dots do the, does the ta have? And we count one dot. We say that means it gets one sound from your instrument. If you don't have an instrument, you can clap your hands and that works just as well. But if you have an instrument, like some bells, you'll say ta. And we have all the children do that with us. Uh, one note about passing out the instruments. Uh, when I pass them out, of course, I have my students all sitting around the edge of the rug and I just scoot them out across the rug to each of the students. And uh, when they get their instrument, I encourage them to try it out right away and make some sound with it right away. I don't ask them to keep it quiet. I don't really see that that's necessary to say, here's an instrument, but don't play it. I, I just say, let me hear the sound right away. Okay, so when we play ta, we give it one sound, ta. Now we're gonna play a whole bunch of ta's in a row. Here we go. Ta, 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 ta. Ta, ta, and stop. 
Good job. Now, TT, let's count the dots. One, two. Two dots, two sounds. T, T. Here we go. T, 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 and stop. Now, diggy, diggy. Let's count the dots. One, two, three, four. Four dots, four sounds. Diggy, diggy. Here we go. Diggy, 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 and stop. And the last one is toe. One long sound. Here we go. Good job, friends. Okay, so um, I want to just um, encourage you to get into the rhythm sounds. Uh, it's really fun. Don't be too uh, concerned about whether you're doing it exactly perfectly right or if the children are doing it exactly perfectly right. It'll take a long time over a period of months for them to really start to learn these sounds. Uh, but what they're doing in addition to all the other obvious uh, benefits of learning how to read and play music notes. This is a wonderful pre-literacy activity. The children are learning how to recognize and read symbols from left to right, and uh, that helps them when they start getting into reading words. Uh, but it's, um, you know, the, like I said, the children won't be uh, playing these sounds correctly right away. So there's, uh, you know, rare children who are really have an aptitude uh, and, and you'll see, wow, that child is just playing the rhythm just right and they just get it. But for many children, this is something so brand new and they'll just be making sounds with their instruments for a long time. But I'm not correcting them. I'm just continuing to introduce and, and lead the activities and just knowing that they will come along in, in their own time and they're getting a benefit along the way. You know, as I said, this, uh, these activities are designed for preschool age kids, but they also apply to infants and toddlers, as well as kindergarten and early elementary age children. Uh, they're just very easily adaptable. So, you know, for instance, an infant or a toddler will not be interacting with this activity the same way as a preschool child might or a kindergarten age child might. They're all gonna have their own, uh, their own um, level of sophistication that they come to it with. And uh, like I say, we just, introduce the activities, we lead these activities, and the children are going to be, you know, coming to it in the way that's most appropriate for them to do at that stage of development that they're in. There's lots of different uh, games and activities I don't have time to get into uh, in this workshop uh, that we do with the rhythm sounds. And when I'm doing these, like I said, in the classroom, I have my rhythm sound cards, and I will start laying them out in different combinations of rhythms. Uh, and we start growing our rhythms longer and longer. And as the children learn how to read them, we're playing these long rhythms. We're having the children help create new rhythms. Uh, we actually get into some physical games where the children are jumping the rhythms, jumping the rhythm sounds. Uh, so there's a lot more that you can get into as you get more developed in this area. So that is the rhythm sounds. Continuing with instrument time, here's a song that we like to use with our instruments. You can use any song that has a strong rhythmic element to it uh, that the children can recognize and play along with. This song is called Gorilla Munch and it has a specific rhythm. So I'll model the rhythm for the children before we start the song. I say, the rhythm of this song is Gorilla Munch, 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 Gorilla Munch, Munch, Munch. And then I'll start the song. And of course, all the children have their instruments already when we start the song. Gorilla Munch, 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 Gorilla Munch, 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 Gorilla Munch, 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 Gorilla Munch, Munch, Munch. There was a big gorilla sleeping in my bed. His head was by my feet and his feet were by my head. He snored so loud that it woke up my dad. Then that big gorilla said, It bounced off of the wall, it bounced 
bounced up on the wall and it went up on the roof. Then that big gorilla said, Ooh, 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 gorilla munch, 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 gorilla munch, 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 gorilla munch, 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 gorilla munch, munch, munch. And the song goes on from there. But you can hear how it has this very strong, specific rhythm, Gorilla Munch, that's easy for the children to recognize and play along with. Now moving on to musical storytelling. So one of the things that we do in all of our music groups is we have a story where the children are interacting with the story. They're participating using their voices, uh, using the instruments to help make the sound effects of the story. Uh, and of course, it has that interactive element at, at its core. So this particular story is about the grouchy monster who lives in the forest. And the interactive elements are the children are actually going to be saying some dialogue, some lines from the story. They're going to be helping. They're, they're actually participants in the story. Uh, and then they're going to be using their instruments to make the sound of the monster shaking the branches of the tree uh, in the story. So uh, this one takes a little more of a detailed introduction. So I'll let the children know that they're going to help me tell this story. Uh, I'll have them, you know, show me how they're going to growl like a grouchy monster and then shake the branches of the tree using their instruments. Like he's so grouchy, he shakes the branches and he growls. And then there's some, some dialogue in the story that I'm going to ask them. So they're really getting, uh, this is a little bit of theater uh, and drama play that they get to get involved with. So in the story, I'll say, friends, if I say, are you going to have a picnic at the park today? You say, no, in the forest. And usually I'll have to prompt them during the story as well. And then they start to get it as we go along. And then I'll say, if I say, don't go in the forest, it's too scary. You say, we're not afraid. And I'll have the children demonstrate how they'll say that. And then we start the story. And uh, this story has a little musical element throughout. So they can help me play the music rhythm with their instruments as well. Once upon a time, there was a grouchy monster who lived in a forest behind a big old tree. And every time someone came walking down the pathway and walked past the tree, the monster would jump out and growl. Friends, what does the monster say? Good job. He was so grouchy, he would growl and he would shake the branches of the tree. Show me how you do that, friends. Everyone who lived in the village nearby was afraid to go in the forest, except for all my friends who are in the music time right now. They were not afraid of the monster. So one day they decided to have a picnic in the forest. So they got their picnic basket and they went to the bakery and they were buying some bread. And the baker said, are you going to have a picnic at the park today? And friends, you say, no, in the forest. And then the baker said, oh, don't go in the forest. There's a grouchy monster there. You say, we're not afraid. Good job, friends. So then they went to the grocery store and they were going up and down the aisles of the store, picking out all kinds of yummy, delicious food for their picnic. And at this point in the story, I will ask the children one at a time to tell me one kind of food that they would like to put in the picnic basket for the picnic. So I usually ask them to choose foods that make their bodies grow healthy and strong and give them energy. And I'll go around the entire group and they'll all choose a kind of food that they want to put in the basket and we'll pantomime putting that kind of food in our picnic basket. And then at the end of the story, I'm going to call back to those foods again. And I try to remember them all. But if I don't remember, I'll ask the friends to remind me. And we'll go back through each of the different types of food when we get to the end of the story. So we got all, we got sandwiches, we got everything in our picnic basket. And we're buying the food at the grocer's. And the grocer says, are you going to have a picnic at the beach today? And you say, no, in the forest. And then the grocer says, oh, don't go in the forest. There's a grouchy monster there. And you say, we're not afraid. Good job. So they got their bread and their picnic basket and all the food. And they went to the forest and they walked down the pathway and they walked past the big old tree. Out jumped the monster and he growled. What does he say? 
and he shook the branches of the tree. Roar! But they were not afraid. So he did it even louder. Roar! And then the friend said, Monster, don't you have any friends? And the monster said, No, and all I have to eat are yucky bugs. And they said, Why don't you have a picnic with us? And he said, Okay. So they got out their picnic basket and all their food. And now we go back through each of the foods that all the children chose uh, during the earlier time in the story. And then we share the food with the monster. All the friends eat their food for their picnic. And then the monster had a nice full tummy of yummy, delicious food. And he got a big smile on his face. And everyone said, yay! And he turned into a friendly monster. And after that, he had lots of friends. And no one was afraid to go in the forest ever again. And that's the end of the story. So there's an example of how we use music and instruments and, and involving the children in participating in helping to tell a musical story. So now that we've talked about interactive music and movement in uh, the form of imaginative movement songs, directed movement songs, instruments and rhythm games, uh, musical storytelling, now we're gonna call back to um, the class management tools and techniques I wanna share with you. Uh, we already talked about the invisible bubble. And I also wanna share with you that even though we call these class management challenges that are really specific to interactive music and movement, I really think of them as opportunities for growth. And the music, uh, interactive music and movement group is really a powerful arena, a laboratory for the children to develop in so many different ways, uh, including impulse control, social and emotional development, the ability to cooperate and work together in a creative way to make something wonderful, like a song or a story or play a game. Uh, so uh, we always want to use class management tools that don't get away, get in the way of this opportunity for growth and development that we are providing for our students. So I like to use that invisible bubble. We say, put on your invisible bubble around your whole body before we start a song where we know the children are gonna be moving around together in the group space. And then we'll call back to the invisible bu bubble as needed uh, during that activity. So uh, of course, a little bit of jostling and bumping will happen during an activity like that. It's totally natural and normal and not a problem as long as the children's bodies are safe. Uh, but if it does get into a situation where it's a little too rough, maybe uh, there's two students that really like to rough house, and maybe that rough housing is getting spilling over and I'm bumping into other kids that aren't aren't interested in that kind of rough housing. We'll say, all right, make sure you have your invisible bubble around your whole body. And you might say, I'm noticing your bodies are bumping, so make sure you put on your invisible bubble and make sure you move where there's room to go without bumping your friends. And usually that's all I have to do to solve an issue like that. Um, uh, really what is the most, uh, the most powerful uh, class management tool that we use is just presenting really fun and engaging material and presenting it in a way that we do it with a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and energy. And that really draws the children in and keeps them engaged in a way that, that really solves 99% of all the class management issues that might crop up. You may notice if you're presenting an activity and the children are getting distracted, uh, it's really up to you to make sure that you shift into another type of activity that's gonna be more engaging for them. Uh, the, the first uh, indication we wanna take, okay, the children aren't, aren't engaged with this thing I'm presenting. You don't have to complete uh, the song. Say you started a song or an activity. The children just are not into it. They're, you're seeing they're just, they're like getting distracted. Maybe they're starting to get a little rough with each other. They're getting, you know, looking at other things in the classroom. Uh, it's That means that the, the activity that you chose is not appropriate for that group at that time. And there's so many different factors that come into that. There's different times of day. For instance, in the morning, you're going to want to present more physical activities that involve a lot of moving physical exercise type of activities because the children come into the classroom in the morning with a lot of energy in their bodies and you want to help them put that energy to a positive creative use and that's why music and movement is such a great thing to do in the morning with your students 
But if you're presenting music in the afternoon, uh, as I hope you will be doing, uh, you might notice that maybe the children just came off of the playground, they're back in the classroom, it's a hot day, they've been running around outside, they're sweaty, they're tired. Uh, it's a good time to do more sitting down stuff like instrument time, storytelling, uh, call and response activities, finger play activities that involve, of course, interactive move movement and interactive using their voices, but, uh, but are not as physical at that time. And then a little later in the group, they've cooled down. They might be ready then for some more physical stuff like moving like animals and things. So it's choosing the right material for the group and noticing that same group is going to have different interests and needs uh, that are going to be ideal for them uh, at different times of day. Just uh, there's so many factors that, that come into that. But it's important for you to be really aware of the group and let them guide you. You know, it's we don't want to force feed them something that's just not working for them at any given moment. Uh, we don't, like I said, we don't have to complete the activity. If I'm presenting an activity, a song, the children aren't responding to it. I do not finish that. I instantly shift into another song or another activity that's going to be more appropriate. And uh, all of a sudden, my students are more engaged uh, because I chose something that's, that's appropriate for where they are uh, at that moment. And that also, you know, factors like their age uh, and all those things do come into play when you're choosing those activities for your students. Also, you know, you may have uh, certain students who are, have challenging classroom behaviors. This is a wonderful environment for them to gain these skills like impulse control and social emotional development that are going to help them in all aspects of their life in your classroom and in their lives in general. You know, they're really gaining these uh, skills and abilities that are going to be something that they're going to carry with them into their lives as they move forward. So uh, what I do if I have a particular child, maybe they're new to preschool, they haven't really developed in a social emotional way where they, they've learned impulse control. That, uh, that, that And so they may be uh, a little extra distracting to the group. They may be acting out in the, in the music time in a way that's not really appropriate. Uh, I don't stifle that. I don't uh, tell them they're doing something wrong or, or I don't, you know, what I do is I, is I, I first use the tool of doing something that's really engaging so that I just, you know, I keep them engaged. I get them re-engaged by presenting something that's more engaging for them. When that doesn't work, then I, I'll, I might say something like, I'm noticing that your body is not ready for music today. Are you able to make it work in music time today? And usually that's all I have to say because uh, the children are very motivated to want to be in the music group because they really enjoy it so much. It's really the highlight of their week for a lot of children. Uh, so it's something that they, that they you know, they'll be asking, is it music time today? Do we get, when do we get to do music? Because, you know, it's something that they really do enjoy. So they're motivated to want to stay in the group. And... Uh, Usually, uh, all I have to do is mention something like, please show me that your body is ready for music today. Uh, I, and what I don't want to do is I don't want to stop everything I'm doing. Like, say I've got this big group of children who are all engaged in music and movement time. And I have just one or two children that I need to do a little correction with on their behavior. I don't want to stop the whole music time because then you're really uh, losing everybody's engagement. You know, uh, when you stop and you have to start specifically engaging with a particular child, what's everybody else doing? They're like, oh, what else is going on that I can get involved with? And you're starting to lose their engagement. So you can really do it without stopping. So you have a song going on, the children are all engaged in the song, and you're just quietly uh, dealing with one specific child that you may need to make a little correction with on their behavior. Uh, the first thing I normally will do is I'll say, oh, Johnny, I've got a special spot for you right over here. If they're next to somebody in the group that they are that they like to wrestle with on the playground and they're getting into a little something that's a little too physical, I move them over to a new space. It's not punitive. It's not, I'm not shaming them in front of their friends or embarrassing them. I do it in a way that's like, this is a special thing. I've got a special space for you to come right over here. And all of a sudden I've adjusted the kind of the chemistry of the group and all of a sudden everything's working better. So that's my first one. 
If that's not working, say I've moved Johnny over here and and he's still having an issue. I, he's, maybe he's grabbing the people next to him or getting a little too elbowy on his friends or something like that. Uh, I'll say, oh, I'm noticing your body's not ready for music time right now. Are you able to make it work in music time today? And uh, normally that helps that situation. If not, if you know he continues to, to have a problem, then I'll just, um, I may ask him to take a break from music. Not again, not in a punitive way. Uh, I may need another teacher to be sitting outside the group where I can say, okay, Johnny, take your body over to that teacher. And then when you're ready to come back and make it work in the music time, you come right back. And I say right away, you don't have to go out for one second. You can come right back in. So it's really, I'm giving them a graduated uh, different choices that they get to make. So it's all up to them. Uh, they get to make their own choice about how that works. And that really uh, is that, it's that wonderful opportunity for social emotional growth that I've been talking about. Of course, we may have children, even this, uh, you know, they, they don't come back in or they do come back in and they're still disrupting. Uh, what I'll do is before the next music time, I will have a very quick little pep talk with that specific child. So before I start the group, we're getting the group ready for music. Before I start engaging with the children, I have my one friend and I say, I know you're going to have such a great time in music today. I know your body's ready for music and you're going to be able to do all the activities and play the instruments. And, uh, and I'll say, but, but if I notice your body's not ready for music, I will ask you to take a break and I'll give them just a little heads up about that. And then sometimes there may be a case when that child over several different sessions still is having an issue and they may end up having to stay outside the group for part of the time, but it's all part of the process. And again, never punitive. It's all about their own choice. And eventually you'll see that that child who needed that little bit of extra work in that area is now able to be a part of the group and has gained that um, social and emotional ability and that impulse control ability that allows them to be involved in the music group. Because believe me, every child loves these music time activities and they love the instrument time. I tend to put the instruments in the latter part of the group and uh, when they're sitting outside the group and they see everybody's got their instruments, they want to be in there. And they will almost 99% of the time, they will be like, I'm ready. <laughs> Whatever it takes, I got to get in there. I want a shaker. I want a bell. I want a triangle. I want a drum. And they're going to do what it takes and make that choice to be able to make it work in the music time. Okay, so we talked about class management. And now we're wrapping up our music time uh, workshop today. Again, my name is Nick Young. I've really enjoyed uh, bringing you these tools and techniques. Uh, you know, I want you to be able to go out into the world, choose music uh, that you're gonna be able to use with your students in your classroom that's gonna be highly engaging and interactive and provide all these wonderful developmental benefits. So this is a directed movement song where the action is standing on one foot and hopping on one foot. So before I start the song, I'll introduce it and I'll say, friends, show me how you can stand on one foot. Here we go. And I'll model the movement of standing on one foot. Stand on one foot, stand up tall, keep your balance steady and true. Now start hopping on that foot. I know what you would do. Hop and hop, turn around to you face forward and up. Raise your arms up to the sky, put both feet down again. Now stand on the other foot. Start hopping on that foot, I know what you can do. Hop and hop, turn around, you face the way. Raise your arms up to the sky, put both feet down again. Now I know you're tired, I know you want to sleep, so lay down on the floor. Pretty soon you're fast asleep, and you start to snore. Before you know it, the morning sun is shining in your window. Everyone jump up, get back to work. Ready, so here we go. Yahoo! Stand up one foot, stand up tall, keep your balance steady and true. Now start hopping on that foot, I know what you can do. Hop and hop, turn around to you face forward and then. Raise your arms up to the sky, put the down again. Woo! All right, thank you, friends.